Hello, everybody. I know that break went so quickly. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the morning sessions and the brief break. I'm Katie Kowalski. I work in the education department at Nord, and I'm so happy to see each and every one of you here. So having worked in the rare disease space for the past few years and having worked in global health for many years before that, I've had the amazing opportunity to meet a number of incredible adults who are living with rare diseases. And in today's session, beyond the diagnosis, uh, beyond disability and the diagnosis, rare disease in adulthood, we're going to explore some of the unique challenges of adults living with rare disorders and also coping me mechanisms and approaches to overcoming barriers. So with us today, we have Dr. Brittany Claiborne. She's a mom, a heart transplant recipient, a cancer survivor, a psychologist, and an author who will be moderating the session. Joining her on stage, we have Laura Bloom. She's the president and CEO of the ehlers Danlow Society and a person living with a rare disorder. And we also have Rebecca Palmer. She's the vice president of advocacy and awareness at Next Generation of Cystinosis and also a person living with a rare disease. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. Good morning, afternoon-ish. Perfect, perfect. Depending on where you hail from originally, it could be morning for you, right? But it's also afternoon for some of us. So I'm going to say good morning, noon, and we're just going to make that work for everybody. My name is Dr. Brittany Claiborne, and as, <clears throat> as Katie mentioned, I am not only a rare disease patient, but I'm also a, uh, a rare disease psychologist, a critical illness psychologist. And I am joined up here by some amazing ladies. I will first start off with letting you, uh, with letting Rebecca Palmer offer a poem for us. I see you, you see me. I see you in your oversized pink hoodie with the word gap written across the front. I nod in your direction and your eyes meet mine. What sounds are playing on your earbuds or is it no sound at all to provide a block to the outside world? Your dog doesn't notice me, nor do they notice my dog. Your dog walks on tiptoes and hugs your leg staring to the side. My dog wag wags his fluffy tail and pulls at his leash, all 12 pounds of Westland Poodle wanting to sniff you both. I urge him to cross on the other side. As we walk around you on the sidewalk, I wonder, do you care for elderly dogs for a side gig or maybe assist family with their pets? Or maybe you are like me as we tend to cross paths at similar times of day. Maybe you do lots of unpaid work as expressions of love for yourself and others. Maybe you maintain your own body's health, doing your best to prevent contagious illness and dispensing your daily medications for chronic illness and keep doctor's appointments and call insurance companies and pharmacists to make sure your treatments and those clinicians who authorize those pills stay within an affordable price range so that you can spend one more day walking that beloved dog. You see me, I can see my reflection in your gaze as we pass in the street. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. We also have with us, we'll hear more from Rebecca in a moment. We also have Laura Bloom with us. Laura, will you tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Laura Bloom, and my kind of day job is uh, president and CEO of the Ellis Danlos Society. And I also live with Ellis Danlos Syndrome. I was diagnosed in 2004 after a 13 year or so diagnostic odyssey, which is actually quite common with EDS and many rare diseases. It tends to be 10 to 12 years is the average time to diagnosis. So life looks very different now to what I thought it would pre-diagnosis, but um, I'm gonna talk to you all a bit more about that today and I'm definitely grateful for it. And I'm, I don't feel like I'm here because of my rare disease, but I certainly wouldn't have fallen into this career and everything without that diagnosis. Perfect, thank you, Laura. And Rebecca, would you mind sharing a little bit of your story with us? 
My parents were 28 years old when I was diagnosed with cystinosis. At that time, they were told I would either need a successful kidney transplant or my death would happen between ages 9 to 12. When my mother was 36 years old and three months out from giving birth to my youngest brother, she donated her kidney to me. Solid organ transplants, as well as bone marrow transplants, come with risks post-surgery. One of them is increased susceptibility to cancer. In kidney transplants, 5% will experience a blood or lymphatic cancer. This is second to skin cancer in those who take anti-rejection medication for their kidney transplant. My mother and my nine-month-old brother stayed with me a lot during chemotherapy treatments when I was 12 years old. My father worked a second job to keep me receiving treatment. My middle brother was 10 years old at the time, and I remember the first time he said, I love you to me. I don't know how he made it through his fifth grade school year. I have had my kidney for 24 years this summer. I am alive because of my whole family. I am coping post-cancer now the last 23 years, also with type 2 diabetes diagnosed after a couple decades of ongoing anti-rejection medicine, in addition to migraines and gastroparesis. I am existing here with complex PTSD and maintain depression and anxiety. My partner and her kids and our dog are now also a part of my world and inspire me to stay present in this life. Amazing. Could you tell us who we see here on the screen? So uh, the picture with the two male presenting individuals are my brothers, uh, Evan, with no hair. And James is that uh, <laughs> baby that was birthed <laughs> before my mom gave me the kidney. Uh, he was actually born on St. Patrick's Day and has red hair. Look at that. Um, that's James. <laughs> And then um, the picture of me and my partner, Jess, who is here with me today, is uh, the two female presenting people. Perfect. Thank you so much. So for me personally, and I feel like uh, yourself, Laura, as well as yourself, Rebecca, feel that it is so important that we continue living, whether you were diagnosed in adulthood or whether you have grown up with a rare disease and now are an adult with a rare disease, um, we still have to do life. We still have to go to work. We still have to have relationships. We still have to be a part of a society that sometimes does not understand that we are just as human. And although we are rare, we require and crave the same things that those of us that don't have rare diseases do. So the acronym that I would like to offer you today as we will go through this morning is I think it's so necessary that we each find an anchor, something that holds us steady in the middle of whatever storm is happening. In the anchor acronym, if we break that down, the first letter, A, I would say would be attitude. So I'm going to pose this question to you, Laura, how does attitude contribute to the rare disease experience? I mean, for me, it's everything. When, when I was diagnosed, I was a photographer and had a career. She's so cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I thought I had my whole career kind of set up ahead and I knew what I wanted to do and I've always been very ambitious. My first degree was related to that that kind of um, career path and then you know eds is a, a a genetic connective tissue condition that affects pretty much everything in the body all the systems your joints it's chronic pain it's your autonomic nervous system so low blood pressure high heart rate and that isn't very conducive to life as a photographer carrying heavy equipment standing for long periods of time and so i knew i needed to change careers and i knew i still wanted a career um, but I, it needed to be something I could adapt to. You know, you need to pivot in life when you hear these things. And a lot of people think, that's it. I can't do anything. And I, I wasn't accepting that. I still wanted a full and long life with ambition and success in it. Um, so at 30 years old, I took myself back to university and decided I wanted to be a spy. Um, and I did a second degree in uh, global politics and international relations. 
and loved it. And at the same time, at the beginning, I wanted to do a job. So I was doing my studies in the evening, six till nine o'clock at night, and I was working part time in, in the day. And I started volunteering and then working at the Ellis Danos support group in the UK. And I, you know, it's actually, I don't know how long I've got, I'll try and tell this story really quickly, but it's very serendipitous how it all came together. As I was leaving, I, I worked at Getty Images and I was leaving there and I was starting my new degree and I was looking for a part-time job and I happened to go to a gallery event that Getty were putting on and I was there talking to a friend of a friend of a friend, someone I've never met before. And we got talking and he said, oh, I've heard you, you're leaving Getty. And I said, yep, you know, it's my last week now. And he said, do you mind me asking why? I said, oh, I've got this health condition you've never heard of. And he said, try me. And I said, I have Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And he said, my daughter died of that when she was 19 years old. Mm. And his daughter had the vascular type of EDS. And it was just like our worlds came together. He was an older gentleman. We, we would just, our paths would never have crossed otherwise, but they were meant to. And we were talking about how we were trying to contact what was then Ehlers Danlos support groups, try and help raise awareness. And he said, let's go together do me a favor, write down everything that you would want from a charity, and let's go with some ideas of how we can raise awareness. So in my typical way, I did that. I wrote a very long list that covered everything that I, I was looking for and needing from a support group and an organization. And we went and met with them. And at the end of the meeting, he said, I've, I've decided how I want to support. I'm going to pay your salary for the length of your degree to do what you put on that piece of paper and you know if you can't do any of it then we're in no worse a position than we were and if you can do some of it great you were looking for a part-time job this works beautifully and I was like huh <laughs> oh, that, no 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 that wasn't the plan someone else needs to do this but that's always the way right you expect other people to try and do what 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 that need is so I thought okay why not I'll give it a go and here I am 13 years later um my wife always says that this is the best cover story ever if I was a spy. So uh, who knows, maybe I am. Um, but <laughs> it, it, it was a career I never expected. Um, and I'm now so privileged to do what I do. Left the UK organization in 2015 to set up the global one. Uh, when I started in 2015, 2016, it was me and one other person part-time. We've just hired our 29th member of staff. Um, ever growing, ever doing great stuff. And in 2020, I was appointed a professor of practice in patient engagement and global collaboration at Penn State College of Medicine. And so keep that attitude that dreams are possible even when living with a rare disease. And you can be ambitious, you can have a career. And I went from being a photographer to thinking I was gonna be female Jack Bauer to now being a professor and a CEO. So you never know what's, what's out there and what's to come, but keep dreaming and dream big. All because of attitude, guys. How amazing is that? Let's give Laura a hand for that. Just the tenacity in that story is, is incredible, incredible. So let's move on to the next letter of Anchor. And after we, um, after we set up that amazing attitude, the next thing that we wanna do is normalize saying that we're not okay. I, most of us, look fine. Most of us look normal. But there are so many things happening under the surface. There's so much maintenance that goes into us looking fine and us looking normal and just preparing. How many of you have to do a preparation of some type to come and stay at this hotel? I did. I needed, I needed like 27 days of medicine for two days stay. It was a whole thing, right? Um, but we were afraid to say I had to do something different because sometimes I'm not okay. So normalizing saying I'm not okay is the next piece of anchoring yourself. Rebecca, how important is it for you um, that we talk about the stigma that comes with the mental health piece of not being okay because of our rare diseases? Um, to me, it is the most important thing, and I want to reference uh, on Nord's website, they recently posted a story. Uh, the author was Rachel O, and she had a journey of the undiagnosed journey. And there was a section in there where she talked about she wanted to say it's not fair, but she hid her real feelings and was determined to have people view her as someone who soldiered on, and that... 
uh, I think that's why we need to normalize the rare experience so much that we should not have to be seen as soldiers battling in a war because disease and disability are not a fair fight and do not discriminate. I love that Rachel was very vulnerable and honest about that in her article. And those who live the chronic and rare life are not only in existence to make non-rare and able-bodied people feel comfortable and good about a less chronic sick life. We are whole people too. Thank you for your article, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel. That's amazing. Uh, amazing, amazing. Um, is there, was there a time for either of you that you struggled with sharing how your mental health was impacted by your rare disease? Oh, absolutely. Um, so when I was uh, 15, 16 years old, I was struggling with living with this pain and symptoms that no one knew what the cause was. I was told it was in my head. I was told by one doctor that if I was a dog, I'd be put down. Um, wow. It was, you know, being bounced from doctor to doctor, just being told it's anxiety, it's growing pains, you're unlucky. Um, and that takes a toll, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're a teenager. And I was also struggling with my sexuality. So in every way, I felt different. And I felt like I wasn't the same as my friends. I had crutches all the time. I had plaster casts all the time. I was fracturing things. And it's just like something was wrong, but everyone was telling me it was in my head. Um, and when I was around 15 and a half, I got a black eye at school. And suddenly I went in and everyone's like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, huh? Oh yeah, this? This is like nothing. And it connected the two that they could see that. And they understood it, and it made sense to them. And I, I suddenly had everyone empathizing with my pain that I was going through. And I was just thinking in my head, this is nothing. I feel a hundred times this every day, you just can't see it. And that stuck with me. And unfortunately, a few months later, I ended up beating myself up. And I beat myself up so badly, I ended up in hospital, and I ended up passing out. And I thought that I had done what that gave me relief before by having that sympathy and that understanding. And in fact, it was the most horrific feeling in the world. And suddenly having everyone looking at me and, are you okay? And thinking pe people attacked me. And it spiraled into this thing where I never ever wanted attention or sympathy again for my health. And actually, I was 16 when that happened, and that was the last time I cried for about 20 years. It was, it just silenced so much emotion, and I didn't realize how much it had impacted my mental health as a teenager, because I then just carried on forward as, I don't want anyone to know I'm sick, I don't want anyone to know I'm in pain, I don't want any sympathy, because I never want to do anything like that again, or feel anything like that again. And... I didn't talk about it for a really, really long time until 2016 when we launched the Ellis Danos Society and I was asked to talk about the patient experience and the importance of diagnosis and validation. Mm. And I think people don't appreciate, you know, in the rare world, it's a, you know, you start on, with an odyssey largely, you know, you struggle to get that diagnosis. There's often no, you know, in EDS, there's no FDA approved therapeutics. There's no, really no clinical trials going on. There's very little out there, but there's validation and there's belief and that can change someone's life. I know it would have changed my life when I was that teenager. I wouldn't have ended up hurting myself the way I did. And I'm sure I would have had a much better journey to understanding and managing the reality of that. And you know, between that and the age of 24 when I was diagnosed, that diagnosis actually became one of the best days of my life. Because finally someone believed what I was saying. They validated years of what I'd been experiencing. And I only wished that they were there when I was that scared 15-year-old girl that put herself through tremendous amounts of pain physically and mentally that I didn't need to. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, Rebecca, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take the next couple. So... The other letters in Anchor are community and hope. Do you have a community? Is it important to your journey? 
and has that community inspired hope within you? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so um, one of the books I have sitting with me is called Roller Skating with Ricketts, and it's by the late Jessica Britt Jondal. And she was one of my peers in the rare community who really encouraged and inspired me. And she has a quote in that book um, by Sir William Osler that says, it is more important to know what kind of patient has the disease than what kind of disease the patient has. And a lot of times, rare disease, while it is part of our identity, it's not our whole identity. We're whole people. There's matters of race, gender, sexuality, ability, age, size, religion, class. And many times as adults, we want to talk about the other parts of ourselves. Yes, on, through the lens of rare disease, but we want to be able to express that. And community at first was hard for me to find. Um, my background, I come from fundamentalist Christian background, and I've had to do a lot in work in reforming my faith. But one of the reasons that I, I left that fundamentalist Christian background was, um, I was I am an adult survivor of child sexual abuse. And that's something that is there's an uncomfortable statistic that when you are someone who has a rare disease or disability, you are 10 times more likely than your peers to have this occur to you. Mm. And uh, I didn't, at the same time, I also didn't realize that I was struggling with my sexuality as well. And in the fundamentalistic religion I came from, that's something we didn't talk about. So I didn't have language until I was in my 20s for that. And I didn't have people I could talk to that were also gay and Christian. I didn't know I could be both. So I participated in a lot of self-hate and also harming other people. And like Shirley Chisholm, who was the first uh, black woman candidate for president in 1972 said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Uh, that really resonates with me because in different family organizations of rare community, it's really hard when patients, adult patients are speaking their lives. Many times in sessions labeled patient sessions, it's the non-rare or the able-bodied parent that's voice is being heard over the centering of the rare voices in the room. So a peer of mine who also is a strong advocate in trans rights in addition to cystinosis awareness, Micah Covington. She came to me in 2019 and said, how would you like to start an organization with me that centers rare adult voices? And I said, yes. And we started Next Generation of Cystinosis together in 2019. In addition to that, I started using the hashtags, hashtag adults living rare, hashtag not an inspirational story, hashtag centering rare voices, and I recently started using Nord's hashtag reimagine rare for the next generation of, uh, of rare speaking. And I feel like there is hope when you take all the parts of you in your intersections and you find a faith community that accepts all of you or you find connection with multiple parts of you because nobody is just one thing ever. And that's, that's important to embrace and speak. And so I have a poetry group in Duluth that is full of neurodivergent queer people that have helped me hone my, my craft in poetry. And then I have um, some online support with being, uh, it's hashtag faithfully LGBT, um, with the intersection of being queer and Christian. And online is a good space if it's not accessible for you to find pieces that accept you. And actually finding Laura's story, um, I watched Issues with My Tissues. I felt so comfortable with Laura. Uh, I was like, I always was that kid, even in um, Bible college and Bible school, I wore tennis shoes with like the dress code of like 
we had to wear long dresses. If we were female presenting, we had to have long hair and long dresses. And like Laura's how she dressed, I'm like, oh my goodness, the tennis shoes with like the nice classy suits. I want to be her and she's rare. <laughs> and so then when Nord was like, oh, you're going to be speaking with Laura Bloom, I was like fangirling. And then I was like, I'm going to so weird her out. <laughs> All right, somebody make sure you get a picture of Rebecca and Laura up here so she can frame it, put it over her couch or her house, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that, Rebecca. Laura, you good? You want to move? You want to switch seats? Good? All right. Uh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> She's slowly inching. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rebecca. Um, and Laura, the, the next letter there is O, and that stands for opportunity. And you've already shared a bit of how just sharing that disease that you thought no one else has heard of has made you an international photography spy with a rare disease um, and that's amazing and I want your autograph too. So um, are there, well, let me ask a different question. What would you tell someone about the opportunities out there to participate in advocacy for their rare disease that may, may not have shared before because they feel it's not, not okay? I always think about the quote, if not me, then who? And I started this thinking, what did I need? What did I want when I was searching for answers? And that drove me at the beginning to be able to create what, was, what is now EDS UK. And then those, my story was replaced by the countless stories I hear and the people I have the incredible privilege to meet every day heartbreaking stories, just horrific stories, wonderful stories, inspiring stories. And my God, there's so much to do. And I know that that is the case in pretty much every rare disease. There is so much to do, and if not me, then who? And that's what I think about every day I wake up. You know, we need to launch a registry, we need to launch a trial, we need to get people diagnosed when their symptoms begin, we need to get management, we need to get pathways, we need to get to a point where health and geography doesn't determine your quality of life, we need to get equitable care, we need to get so much. There is so much need and so much opportunity to make our lives better. And if not me, then who? And I turn that to all of you. You can make a change. I was just... Uh, you know, 20, you know, 30 year old looking to, to become a spy and take pictures and, and here I am and we've created an incredible movement and I'm, it takes the village and I'm so proud of what we've done at the Ellers Danlos Society. We are trailblazing in so many ways because you see a need and you need to fill it and you need to do it and you need to change the landscape out there because it's simply still not good enough in rare. Perfect. Thank you so much. And lastly, the R in anchor stands for rest. There is always going to be something to do. Yes, ladies? Mm -hmm. Whether it is just in our normal everyday lives, because we are adulting out here in these streets. Sorry. <sighs> the bills keep coming. Anybody else keep getting bills at their house? I keep getting bills. I'm not really sure what it's, I paid it and I thought that was it, but apparently it recurs. Um, Sorry, I'm so upset about that. No, you should try living in the UK right now with the energy and the inflation. Oh, congratulations the... on your... The king. king. Yeah, the king. That's so awesome. Billions on the coronation and people can't Good feed and, and heat their homes. But yeah, God save the queen. The king. King. <laughs> king. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> you king. are a spy. Um... So rest, rest, we're talking about rest. Um, there will always be something to be done, whether it's in advocacy or whether it's just a part of our everyday lives. But I, as a rare disease patient, as the mother of a 12 year old boy that recently announced that he has a girlfriend, <laughs> that's what I said, okay? First of all, I'm 12 on Monday. So if y'all see something on the news about a 38 year old woman impersonating a 12 year old that's me. Um, there's always something and there will always be more. But the very first thing that we have to do, whether it's our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health, is we have to listen to our bodies and know when to rest, but most importantly, how to rest. 
what is one of the ways that you rest, Rebecca? How is how do you de-stress? How do you detach? How do you allow yourself to be, per se? For me, it's a mixture of things. I didn't get into um, any type of professional therapy until I was around 23, 24 years old. So um, the access for me didn't happen until I was that old. Uh, I have a cognitive behavioral therapist, which recently switched to an acceptance and awareness therapist because of my complex PTSD. Often the cognitive behavioral stuff actually just exacerbates the spiraling thoughts. So the acceptance therapy is more neurodivergent friendly and more PTSD anxiety, depression friendly. And then the community I mentioned uh, that has, it, it's a matter of spending time with loved ones, family and friends. And then there's also hobbies. Uh, I am a writer and an author. So for me, reading is a big part of my work, but it's also a big part of my rest, um, especially taking a break from reading medicine or uh, religious articles, I will go into the fantasy genre and science fiction and just rest my mind that way. And actually, um, my partner brought this to my awareness about different kinds of rest. There's not just resting physically, there's also resting mentally and emotionally. And sometimes there's days where you just need to focus on maintaining your medication and sleeping and eating, and that is okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Laura, how do you rest? Well, life is very different because um, uh, 11 and a half weeks ago, my daughter was born. Um, and obviously, life is very different with a baby. Um, it's wonderful. And she's, she sleeps more than me. It's, it's I, I lay in bed being like, can she wake up now? I mean, we have to, I have to say we're very blessed. So she hasn't taken away sleep, um, but she's changed my priorities. So I'm, I travel a lot with work. Last year, I did 40-something flights. Um, and this year, I said, I want to be close to my family. I don't want to miss bath times and her growing up and we've actually been in the US for the past month um, with my wife and daughter so that I would could go to these events and meetings that I had and I didn't have to fly back and forth and the toll on my body that that takes which is immense um, and you know missing them so thank you they're here thank you to my wife for um, slapping everything we had like seven cases that <laughs> have come with us uh, she's amazing and it's been incredible even just here having them in the audience you know sharing these things um, is amazing and if you promise not to judge me I will tell you about how I rest I promise to think about not judging you so I, I, I watch really bad reality TV <laughs> and my favorite is 90 Day do, Fiance is it oh did y'all do Love is Blind did y'all do it? Love is Blind <laughs> Married at first sight, million dollar list. I mean, like, oh, it's so <laughs> mindless and embarrassing. Um, my wife judges me daily um, on it. Um, but that's how I switch off. The more mindless, the better. The more ridiculous, the better. Uh, reality TV. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I'm not going to tell y'all how I rest. I'm just, because I don't have to, I'm the moderator. So I'm going to take advantage. Um, so we are going to begin to move in the question and answer section. So if you have any questions for myself or for Laura or for Rebecca, please, those note cards that you have, please write them down and go ahead and collect them. While you guys are writing that down, I have one last question for these ladies. Uh, Rebecca, tell me, what is something you've been able to accomplish by being anchored? Something I'm able to accomplish accomplished by being anchored. So I would say my poetry work. And I would also say the friendships and connection I've been able to garner with people across all different walks of life, especially in the rare world. Um, being a living, poor, rural, white, 
and in a highly fundamentalist community, you unless you travel, you really don't get outside of your perspective. And if I hadn't been diagnosed with cystinosis, uh, the traveling would not have happened. And in the medical world is so diverse. So I was introduced to diversity very early. Um, for me, there was no before my diagnosis. There was always the diagnosis because it was a diagnosis that happened to my parents when I was five years old. So it just, it's, it, it is what it is. And diversity I was introduced to through the medical world. So being anchored, um, those connections, and also being able to grow my poetry with that are two things that have really anchored and grounded me. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, how do you want to do this? Christina, is Lola awake? She's asleep. She's asleep. She wanted okay. me to bring Lola up, my daughter, because honestly. I wanted to meet Lola, personally. <laughs> I think she's asleep, and I will not wake a sleeping baby. Um, but she's definitely anchored me. Um, there's been lots. Of, I, I'm very lucky to ha have been anchored a lot throughout um, my life by people, by experiences. Um, but honestly, as well, the people that I get to meet and work with every day anchor me and keep me doing what I'm doing. So, yeah. Perfect. Do we have any questions? We do. First question, as a teen with rare disease, I often struggle with the fear of missing out or FOMO and explaining my condition to my friends. How did you manage that and what advice do you have? Which one of you ladies would like to take that? I'm happy to take that. Um, so that I so relate to that. Um, and I think that there's a real danger that a couple of things can happen. So the first thing is, is that it's so exhausting to think about explaining your condition, especially something with EDS that can be so sporadic. You know, one day you can be out, you can be thriving, you can be active, and the next day you can't even lift your head. And it's so difficult for people around you to understand that. And what sometimes happens is that to help people understand, people sink in and don't have those good days because it's easier for people to understand a consistent. And so people end up having more bad days when actually they're, they're almost scared to have the good days because people won't understand or worse, believe them. And I think that's terrible. So if you know someone living with one of these diseases, the best thing you can do is let them have as many good days as they can. Don't question them. Be there for the bad days, the good days, and everything in between. And when you're living with that rare condition, you have to accept and appreciate that it is difficult for people around you. You can't assume that they're going to get it and they're going to understand. So give them the benefit of the doubt. Talk to them. Tell them how this feels, that it could be different. It could be the same every day, how it makes you feel. You might miss out on things. Can, can we do things more at home instead of out? Can, you know, just show how adaptions can m mean that you can still be involved and not have that FOMO, because FOMO is real. I hate FOMO. Like, it's, it's real and it hurts, and it will impact your mental health and, and your physical health as well. You want to thrive and you want to be doing as much as you can, and it's the people around you that will help you do that. And they won't understand it unless you communicate to them. So talk to them and try and make them understand. Perfect. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you. One more question? Can you recall any encounters with healthcare providers that were particularly helpful to you? If so, what did that provider do or not do to better support you as a whole person? I, I can relate a short anecdote. I mentioned in my speaking that I am an adult survivor of child sexual abuse, and I had this amazing medical professional, because uh, medical PTS PTSD is also real. And a lot of times when you're in a medical setting, uh, nurses and doctors are just touching you and grabbing you. And obviously, it's not in, an, in, a, in, a, in a manner, but it's just it's alarming. And when you have a history of being um, touched unwantingly, it's, it's a huge deal being constantly in medical settings. I had this... Um, nurse at this ophthalmologist appointment who would 
before she would put the eye drops in my eyes, she would be like, I'm going to come near you and I'm gonna put my hand on your shoulder right now so I can help you with your eye drops. And as someone with cystinosis, um, the eyes are one of the many organs that are affected. So you're very photophobic and sensitive in your eyes as well. And so that she did that for me as someone with cystinosis, but also as someone who touch, I really appreciate being told before I'm touched. Um, that was one of the first times that I felt actually comfortable at an appointment um, was the recognition that, oh, you're a human being. You have your body, I have my body, I'm going to stand near you. Okay, right now we're gonna go over this. That was incredibly meaningful and helpful. Amazing, thank you so much. And thank you to that nurse that yes. thought enough to do that. What do you want us to go from here? Do we wanna do one more question? Okay, perfect. Um, I'm here all day. Are you here all day? I'm here all day. She's here. Are you? Here? Well, I'm not going to ask you any questions. Um, <laughs> no questions for spies. <laughs> if you see her, grab her. But I don't know if she's leaving. I'm not going to. I'm leaving in the next hour or so. I've got to drive back to New York, and we're heading home. She's definitely a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please give an amazing hand for these brave ladies? Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing your experience of rare disease in adulthood and the fact that you are being human and the fact that you are creating families that look like love. And that's, that's incredible and that's amazing. And you're spreading love and you're building communities and you're helping to change the rare world so that rare is normal actually. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for all that you do in your companies and in your spaces. I look forward to seeing whatever you have coming in the horizon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.